you have your uh, laptop with you, we'd love it if you would go ahead and open it up and log on uh, and follow along with us. And throughout our presentation, we'll have some links that you can link to some things that make it a little bit more interesting for you and for us as well. So if you have the opportunity to do that, we'd like you to. I'm just still enjoying. I, I sounded so much more impressive than I typically feel. I mean, that was really, I, that, thank you very much. I feel Sorry. very. Um, let's go ahead and get started. This is a presentation that Professor Penland and I have made um, several times over the last couple of months. We went to Duke Law School and worked with their 1Ls, Wake Forest, Drake. Um, and so we're delighted to be here. Neither one of us has ever been to Milwaukee. So um, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, this is a program that we developed a year ago at Drake um, to address professionalism in electronic communication. And it's actually at Drake part of a extended orientation session that we do with our, our law students. There are three sessions. One focuses on ethics, the rules of ethics, um, particularly the um, inquiry into the uh, character, uh, fitness for character for sitting for the bar um, inquiry that you'll all have to go through before you sit for the, the bar in whatever state you want to seek admission in. This is a session on professionalism, and we have a third session on character. Our students also read a textbook in their legal writing course that sets up um, the sort of sources of influence in that way. And so I, I did want to just start with sort of a common shared understanding. When we think about behaving ethically and professionally in law practice, we want to think about what guides us. You know, what are some of the resources that we would consult um, to ascertain how to behave properly? Um, we break those down into three main categories or sources of influence. The first are the rules of ethics that you must abide by in order to attain and maintain your license to practice law. They're pretty straightforward, things like competence, diligence, and you will be required to adhere to those um, standards of ethical rules when you become admitted to the bar in a particular state. Every state adopts some form of the model rules of professional conduct. Those are the floor. If you fall below those standards of conduct, you put your license to practice in jeopardy. Um, sort of above that is this concept of professionalism. By that, we may be referring sometimes to a formal code that a local or state bar association asks you to abide by. Those types of codes often deal with things like civility, courtesy. But at a broader level, we're also referring to sort of conditions or expectations of professionalism of the, within the practice. How do we as lawyers expect to treat one another? Conventions of professionalism. Um, that's the focus here today. When we are going to be talking about electronic communication, we're going to be talking about conventions or expectations of professionalism rather than the rules of ethics that may guide you in connection with electronic communication. The third sort of source or category of influence it's just your personal character and integrity. That's broader than what impacts solely your professional life, um, but is a third source of influence. Also, in order to get some shared understanding to begin the session, um, we wanted to kind of explain why we decided to focus deliberately on electronic communication. Both Professor Penland and I teach legal writing, so we teach um, communication in written form in a variety of formats. We also teach um, oral or verbal communication in terms of oral advocacy, that type of thing. We deliberately selected electronic communication. By that I mean text messaging, email, and um, social networking sites like MySpace and Facebook. We deliberately selected that format um, for a variety of reasons. We think that there are certain attributes associated with this form of communication that sometimes give rise to lapses in professionalism, unintended lapses in professionalism. The first is informality. We think of text messaging and email as being far less formal than hard copy correspondence, right? There's an informality, almost an anonymity associated with sending out an email. It's an informal means of communication. There's a timing quality associated with electronic communication that makes it differ from real-time communication. On the one hand, there's an instantaneous quality. We always use the, uh, I have to move this. I'm going to trip over it. 
We always use the example of the hostile email. I am really mad at, what's your last name? Van Rowe. I'm really mad at Ms. Van Rowe, and I'm going to fire off a nasty email. You know, I might regret it later, right? But when I fire off that nasty email and I hit send, it's out. It's instantaneously communicated. But there's an asynchronous quality with respect to the dialogue. Ms. Van Rowe is going to open up her email not knowing who I am or why I'm so incensed at her, right? She's just going to open it up and see this hostile email. I, on the other hand, have sent it, and I don't have to deal with her response until I'm ready to go back to my computer and deal with her response. Whereas if I'm going to confront her face to face, I'm going to have to deal with that reaction right away. So there's an asynchronous quality associated with an electronic dialogue. Um, there's also this concept of a public versus private nature. When we talk about um, instant messaging, email, um, social networking sites where we've deliberately instituted some privacy controls, we think of that form of communication as being private, that we have some sort of privacy expectation. But as your readings revealed, so often things that you intend to be private to the recipient can be shared. Other people can pick up your phone and read your text messages. Um, people can intercept emails or um, forward emails that you didn't intend to go to multiple recipients. Um, and we've read about enough people um, in popular culture recently whose MySpace pages became public, very, very public, and they never intended them to be. So there, these are the qualities associated with electronic communication that sort of focus Professor Penland's and my research, research interests on um, sort of the intersection of professionalism in the context of this particular type of communication. It's precisely those aspects of the electronic communication that cause us sometimes not to pay the type of attention that we ought to when we're communicating in that way. So because it's instantaneous and it seems a bit informal and uh, we also have this feeling that it's private, we may not be paying the same type of attention. And uh, Professor Warish and I gave you some things to read, which I hope you did. Uh, did anyone read about uh, Diana Abdallah and the blah, blah, blah email? Can someone tell me what that's all about? Wow, so many volunteers today. How could today. you possibly <laughs> be shy at this point in the semester? It's Friday, you got pizza. Tell me about Diana. What happened with her? I think at that point, yeah, if a, a real lawyer, she says to this potential employer in the uh, legal community, would have put our agreement in writing. To which Diana Abdallah replied, blah, blah, blah. blah. <laughs> well, the way this became public is that her potential employer had a friend, and he, you know, as you will, he passed it on to his friend, and his friend said, do you mind, would you mind if I share this with a few other people? And he did. And what happened was the story of Diana Abdallah may not be well known to you, but believe me, it's well known to your professors, it's well known to lawyers. Uh, Diana Abdallah now is listed in Wikipedia. Did uh, both Diana Abdallah and her employer engage in uh, similar conduct? Yes. But being the junior lawyer, she's the one who became well known. An example of someone deliberately disseminating a private communication 
In your reading, we also had a rendition of a tale from Des Moines, our hometown, of an athletic director for a Catholic school. Can anyone tell me what that one was about? What happened in that one? Somebody else read it, right? We got one, Lisa? Okay. So you have an athletic director who works for a Catholic institution who disparages some uh, a priest and perhaps the, a girls' team within the Catholic institution, and he writes a very private email to his brother-in-law, an athletic director, I believe, at another school. Somehow, this particular email, he inadvertently appends it to an email that's written in his workplace. So his employer uh, learns about it. And what happens is even though he's very apologetic, he, ha he ultimately uh, loses his job. This was a, an example where an inadvertent dissemination of an email communication had uh, per, uh, rash results for this individual in his employment. So we think that uh, what we'd like you to do as we're talking about this, we want you to think about uh, how you would craft an email, and it, especially in your professional life, if you will. So we're going to look at a series of emails. And if you... Uh, uh, click on the Colossal McGuire project. It'll bring you to a series of email. It's not working. Is anybody up with us? Docs, DOCS, professionalism, orientation, students. We checked it this morning. Nobody's on it? The dot orientation. Did you do students all in caps? Yeah, I'm sure somebody out there got it. There's no spaces. 404 error. Uh-huh. Yeah, where's our tech guy now? He's swinging a miss there. What, what's a 404 error? OK. Did you, did you enter the HTTP? OK. Okay. Should we Dex. It, should we bring it up on our? Yeah, we can start okay. by just. Uh, we'll bring it up on ours. We really like for you to have the opportunity to look at it on your computer. I tell you what. What we'll do is we'll go ahead and bring it up, and um, we'd like you to get in small groups and sort of. We'll go through these. There's a what? Are you with us now? law.drake.edu. Yeah, law.drake.edu. Okay. At the end? No, here. Oh. It's a it's an educational website, so it's I got no chalk. Okay. So just insert law. Law.drake. At any rate, okay. so as, as you're working to get on there then, uh, I'll just set this up for you. It's basically it's a series of emails, fictitious. Uh, that are set in a law firm setting between two associates who are assigned to work on a project together. It will be Christine and Dylan. And as they begin to work through their project, things don't go exactly as planned. And uh, they write to one another back and forth and ultimately get a senior associate involved and then a partner in their law firm involved. So if you've got it pulled up now, what we'd Not like you to do right is get in groups think. and uh, take a look at that. And as you're going through, think of the things that you think are good that some, you would want to see in a professional email and those that you wouldn't. And what I'd like you to do when we get back together is rather than just tell me that it's not good or it's bad, explain to me why you think uh, this isn't good or it, it, it's bad or why they did something well. So if you can get in groups and Are you all finding the now? PowerPoint? Because there are additional links throughout the PowerPoint. OK, so rather than just going to this website for the email exchange, you need to go to the one that has the uh, PowerPoint itself. So find somebody with a computer. You must uh, make noise. <laughs> yes. So 
When you don't make noise, what I do is walk up, and that means you're going to have to turn off eBay and turn off the, you know, checking the, how the Indians are doing. Did you get it? So if I looked over, I wouldn't see eBay? No way. <laughs> see, I'm used to seeing things that I shouldn't see, like eBay and... I actually have on my course policies, if I can't shop on eBay during class, then neither can you. Fair enough, I think so. You guys Okay, am I on? Can you all hear me? Can you hear me? Excellent. Um, let's go through some of these and just let's talk about what as the reader, how we respond to some of these emails. So let's take that first one from Dylan, one uh, associate to, uh, actually this was from Christine to Dylan, and they've been assigned the project. So what do you think about this? Anything in particular stand out about Christine's email? Anything in particular? There you go. Well, what do you mean by a bad attitude? What, what sorts of things does she say that events a bad attitude and toward what? Slave drivers. Slave drivers. So maybe uh, I'm expressing something about my employer here. Okay. What, uh, anything else that expresses how she feels about her employer or? Bogus crap. Oh, bogus McGuire crap right in the, uh, that, oh, that wasn't up in the signature. That in colossal the, McGuire project is the is Ray the, Clause. It's but the Ray Clause, and that her client, she's going, if her client would happen to see this, it's called the bogus McGuire crap. Anything else that you see in this? A lot of personal stuff in her email, a lot of personal uh, things that perhaps she wouldn't want to share with everyone. Go ahead. Okay, a lot of generalizations and um, opinions that aren't expressive opinions. So you should avoid insults, generalizations, and any opinions that you're not saying, in my opinion, prior. Okay, so sh what, what do you mean by a generalization? Um, slave drivers, um, characterizations, and then just generalizing negative. Opinions. Okay, some general characterizations of different folks. <laughs> Someone? Yeah, I like her. She says, I'll take a little book. Thank you. Archive folders. She's going to roll up her sleeves, isn't she? What do you think about her uh, saying, why don't you take all the jurisdictional claims? Okay. How about uh, Dylan's response? Right. What do you think about his response? Now recognize the con context here. We're in a law firm. They've been given a project with no real division of responsibility. They've got to divide this up. The client, Mr. Buckets of Money, needs the work done, right? What's, what about his response? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think... Recognize that, again, he's got to communicate back. We're trying to divvy up the work, okay? Is it, is it of interest at all that they're using email communication? Okay, and why do you think? Or, and do you think if they're working in the same firm, they might even have offices somewhere in the same building? So, right, so where do, where do you begin sometimes in your communication? What about this one then? As we move on, Christine emails back. I'm just going to go back real quick. Okay. Also, since we're under um, time constraints, emailing, you know, take some time to get their email, making a call right away, it's going to set up their plans right away and they get started on the project. Yeah, that's a, a little, little bit point. of efficiency yeah. in, in, you, in what type of communication are you going to use to be as efficient as you possibly can. Right, which I think is, is a great point when you look at the next exchange. The, the assignment was given on a, on a Thursday. And now it's Tuesday. Okay, so what do you think about these two exchanges? This is Christine back to Dylan, getting back to him on Tuesday. How 
How about what? What's she done now? How? What's she done? Done some work? No, and she talks about being which is again about her personal life and her professional And she acknowledges that she hasn't done anything. She sort of tries to characterize it as though she has done something, but you know from right. yes. Right, right. Now what happens? What happens in this next exchange? What does he do? Who's Schmidt? He tells on it. <laughs> yeah. Uh-uh. Uh he goes to Greg Schmidt. Now what do you think about this? He's frustrated. The work's not getting done. He'd already done a good deal of work on half of the problem that she elected to just piggyback onto and then not have to do the, the new, the new uh, legal issue. What about is going to Greg Schmidt, the senior associate. Yes. No, I th you think you're absolutely right. He's being fairly um, directive to his senior associate. Here's what you need to do, right? A lot of us have been complaining about her. Okay, now Greg Schmidt, he's involved. He goes to the senior partner, Bill Lohman, who I always like to cast as Gene Hackman. You know, Gene Hackman would make a great Bill Lohman. They're like, who's Gene Hackman? They probably don't know who Gene Hackman is. You guys know who Gene Hackman is. <laughs> there we go. So what do you think of uh, how Greg Schmidt, the senior associate, has to, he takes it up to the senior partner? Do you have a comment? Just rolling up your sleeves. It's going to start this okay. where I start looking at people right. and they do this. We've got one. We've got a volunteer. It's, I mean, it's, it's kind of too bad that this kind of keeps getting passed up and up. Um, I mean, back with, uh, you know, before, it, you know, he should have, if he was having a problem with, with Brown, you know, probably should have tried to address that directly with her. You know, he passes up the buck and then he's, you know, basically doing the same thing where, you know, oh, well, I don't want to deal with this, you know, just kind of passing it up the ladder. And, it, it takes a problem that could probably be a pretty small problem and exacerbates it. Okay. Anybody else have a comment about Greg's behavior? Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, fortunately, Bill immediately responds. We're crying out loud. What do we think of Bill? Is that okay? Because he's, you know what, he's the big boss. He gets to do this, right? It's okay. It's one thing if the associates uh, don't exhibit exactly the kind of behavior you want. But this is okay, right? It's a very good point. He said, how, how could he expect diplomatic, courteous, civil dialogue with his associates if he's Mr. For Crying Out Loud? Okay? So is it, is it, is it yes? Kind of like all those Enron emails that said it's been a really miserable week here. I've had so much shredding to do. I'm exhausted. I've been shredding all week yeah. via as email. A, yeah, as a lawyer, you want to be careful of the type of not only paper trail, but now electronic trail that follows you. That's absolutely right. Um, so what, what happens then uh, once the uh, senior partner in charge of this project gets a hold of it? So. He emails back down to uh, Dylan. Was that that worked out great for Dylan, didn't it? Somebody has to get the client's work done. We all can agree on that. The client's work needs to be done. So he gives it all to Dylan. Okay, and he gets to do that because the client's work needs to be done. How about Dylan's response to the senior partner? Yes.
Did you hear what she said? He seems very agitated. I'm sure he's very agitated, right? Law, uh, being a lawyer is a demanding job, but he's very apparently agitated. And she also remarked that he's asking for information that's probably right there in the file. Either right how there is in he the file for or it? could get it fairly easily. Right, and how is he asking for it? Yes. Yeah, here's what you need to do for me, okay? Because you're not busy. He is right. out on the links, but <laughs> we okay. would otherwise assume that he might be He has busy. a couple more, more questions. He had another question. I think it was 12.04, and at 12.07 he had another question. What about this? Do you, I mean, do you, is you, does that strike you, that he sent five or, you know, three or four emails in five or six minutes? Is that okay? How, how does that, what, what impression do you have with regard to that? Yes. Okay. Yeah. He's dead. Not, not super organized, yes. Ding, ding, ding. Yep. Yes. How about hello? At least a hello. Yeah. Do a bill. How about this? Okay. And this is the response. Okay. So what happens to Christine? This is, this is a good result for her as well, right? What does Christine get to work on? Well, she landed on her feet. Christine's going to take on the uh, DUI. Uh, tell us what you, what you think, though, about when Christine responds to that uh, assignment. Anything in there that you like? Yes. She doesn't take responsibility. Indeed, she goes so far as to acknowledge that she tried to behave professionally. Right? Is that accurate? Is that an accurate characterization? Did you have a comment? Somebody up here? Nope. Okay. She, she shifts the blame, pointing the finger, and making sure that there's no misunderstanding that by labeling her behavior as professional, it becomes professional because that's what she called it. That works. Is there anything we like in this email? Did she do anything right? Is she actually thanking for trusting her with this work rather than continuing about the work? Or is she saying, fine, I'll do it? Um, and then she offered to go further and attend the meeting if, if So she's doing a, she is doing a couple of things right. You know, she's uh, offering to help out a little bit. She did apologize. We don't like the apology because it's an uh, I'm sorry, but, which always detracts from your apology. In fact, it usually cancels it out. Right. So after we've looked at it, this is the things that you guys have come up with after we looked at it, the things that you, a little checklist as you go to write your email when you're uh, corresponding via email in the office, if you're using electronic communication. This would be true whether it's email or uh, instant messaging or some other type of dialogue. But the first thing was, is it the appropriate method of communication? Uh, have I actually thought about whether I want to email, or would it be better if I walked down the hall and talked to this person face-to-face? -to, -face? Uh, in some instances, you may find that it's better to send a formal letter. So think about the type of communication that you're going to use. We want to think about the hierarchy. We want to think about, you know, who is my audience? And, you know, is it some people it's okay to... Um, correspond with informally. Um, some people we want to be more formal when we address um, that type, particular type of person. Um, we want to make sure that, I mean, you need to treat email correspondence, particularly in law practice, as though it might become public. And I don't think that Mr. Buckets of Money would feel like this lawyer had a great deal of respect for his legal work 
if he saw that exchange. So we need to think about our clients, we need to think about our colleagues and the business and legal processes. So let's transition now from email communication to um, communication uh, through the internet. Uh, we think about primarily um, social networking sites like MySpace, Facebook. Um, how many of you all have a MySpace or Facebook page? Maybe, how many of you don't have a MySpace or Facebook page? Okay, so a fair number. Those of you who do have a MySpace or Facebook page, do you institute privacy controls? Okay. Have you ever known anyone who instituted privacy controls and yet found out that people other than his friends or her friends had, had viewed his site, his or her site? Have you ever seen any lapses in these control mechanisms? No, nope, never? You've probably heard about a couple of those, like Miss New Jersey and... We've, we've even recently had one, it, it, I think it came out just this week, and this one's fun because it's not, uh, it's not uh, just one of you, so to speak, it's one of us. It was the president of Salisbury University who showed a few things on uh, her, I, I believe it was a Facebook, and they were disseminated, and her comment was, I thought my controls would prevent a broader dissemination. Were the things that she had uh, posted hugely uh, awful that we'd all just go, <gasps> no, but they weren't the kind of thing that you should post as a professional. So not just students, but uh, professionals make these mistakes. We went ahead and put together a MySpace page for uh, Chris T. and Dylan. And if you Thank click you on the so link, yes. here's Chris T. Here's her MySpace page. Okay, or she, is it, yes, MySpace page. And she's blogging, she's blogging about what she's been working on. And you should be able to open those on your computer as well if you click on the sites. So what do you guys think about uh, Christy? Do you want them to break down or just talk about it? We'll just talk about it. What do you think about Christy? Is this good? And uh, this is Christy's social networking site. You, know, you may remember that Christy and Dylan went to law school together and undoubtedly have a lot of um, friends and colleagues in common. They're just keeping up with their friends and colleagues, so she's blogging about work. Does, it, does, this, does, does this particular post strike you as unprofessional in any way? What do we see here that makes us a little uncomfortable? Yes? She's talking about her boss's kids' DUI boss probably wouldn't appreciate revealing that, right? All of her entries are during work. She's blogging in the middle of a work day. Excellent. Do you remember the gal who was writing uh, a, a book during her work on, uh, online? You what else? About that one. Does anything else about this post make you a little uncomfortable? Yes. Right. Instilling all sorts of confidence in her clients and the bench and bar alike. And as you well know, too, that sometimes even when you have these controls on MySpace or Facebook, it'll still bring up the picture. You have the one picture that comes up, so even if people can't access all your blogs and things, if you have it limited, it'll still bring up whatever picture you post there. So uh, you might want to think about that. Okay. How about, I know where Parker lives and I'm totally going to go after his. I heard he has a wimpy wife. Is it possible that that could be misconstrued? We, we might not think that Christy is actually threatening Dylan's wife, but is it possible that that could be misconstrued? Okay. Let's take a look at... We like Dylan. We think he's very suave. He's what every guy lawyer ought to be. He's advocate. The advocate. And he's fr but he's frustrated, okay? He's what a lawyer ought to be, but he's frustrated. Uh, tell us what you think about what he expresses on this particular blog.
You're the other one. I don't see anyone out there. They're avoiding eye contact. You guys I know. are avoiding eye contact. They're going to start crawling <laughs> underneath the... Don't avoid eye contact. Go ahead. How about this one? I lunch with some upper echelon at Highclon today. Sounds like there might, might be some kind of a buyout of a smaller industry player out of Omaha. I guess it's a pretty well-known competitor as the market cornered over there in Nebraska. Interesting stuff. As, assume that there is, that this wouldn't present an ethical violation. Okay, assume that. Is it okay to talk about that sort of thing where other people can read it? I mean, if we assume that it doesn't um, rise to the level of revealing a client confidence such that his license is in jeopardy, is it okay? Yeah, clients expect us to be discreet, even with regard to matters that wouldn't necessarily rise to the level of uh, a client confidence. It's similar to the situation where Christine uh, talks about working on her boss's son's DUI. Uh, that may be a public record if it's been filed. However, it may not be public knowledge. So you need to think about whether the things you're talking about are things that your client would want you to reveal or someone in your office. So, so what does this all mean? We come in and we're talking about professionalism. It seems like a fairly straightforward con you know, concept. And we've shown you what we think are some exaggerated lapses in professionalism with the associate talking about her weekend plans to get blitzed. And we've, we've looked at some that are slightly more subtle, right? Um, why does it matter if what we're talking about today, and, and as, we, as we said at the beginning of the lecture in terms of context, we're not really talking about lapses that implicate your law license, right? These are just conventions or expectations of how we behave in practice. What does this all mean to me? How does it implicate my legal, legal education? If you look around, if this law school is like most law schools, many of you will be practicing together. Okay? So the way that you treat each other now sets the stage for the impressions that you'll have of each other when you sit opposite counsel table later in your law career. Your life as a lawyer started when you began law school. Okay? So if you're the guy who thinks, you know, law school is really competitive and I really need to get a good job so I'm going to hide the books in the library to the extent that anybody still uses books in the library. I'm going to hide the books in the library. I won't do this when I'm in practice, but I have all this pressure now to get a great job. You know, you'll forever be known as the guy who hid the books in the library. Or, or is it likely that someone's going to be gener generous with you in law practice and, and asking for an extension? No, probably not. Um, if you fire off frustrated emails to your law faculty, is it likely that anyone's going to feel um, encouraged to write a letter of recommendation for you? No, probably not. The matter of how we treat one another starts here in, in, in um, law school. When you get out into your career, your ability to enjoy your career will be based in part on the relationships that you form, not just with people with whom you work, but people who are working in the community that, again, you may sit opposite um, council's table. Um, having good relationships with people in the law community um, has a direct bearing on how successful you'll be as a lawyer. You know, the reputation that you have before the court has a large impact on how your, treating, your pleadings are treated and how you're treated when you come before um, uh, the court. So it affects your ability to be a good lawyer. It also affects your ability to have those relationships that make a law career gratifying. We assume everyone who comes to law school wants to be a lawyer, wants to be a good lawyer, and wants to be a happy lawyer, right? That bleeds into your whole life. So again, it's about forming those relationships and having the reputation as someone who is deliberate and thoughtful and courteous. It's not as though you're not going to get into law practice and get angry and get frustrated, but it's about being really thoughtful and deliberate as you communicate, not just in person where the reactions are so apparent that sometimes we temper our behavior, but even when we send emails, 
and when we communicate online. So we always say there's all sorts of room at the top. You want to be a really, really well-respected lawyer who enjoys a great reputation. So it's all about what kind of lawyer you want to be. We really appreciate you guys being so enthusiastic. It's been a lot of fun to be here with you today. So thank you Thanks very so much. much.